My name is Phil Falpa. I'm the executive director for the Latino Business Action Network, uh, or LBAN. This morning, we've got some uh, opening remarks by uh, Dean John Levin of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, and the event will cover an overview of both the, the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative, and will explain all of these different organizations as part of this. Um, in addition to that, we'll go through all of the data from the research for this year. Uh, and then following that, we have a discussion of the implications of that data by Mr. Rupert Murdoch and Mr. Sultan Rubio. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you to the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'd like to start by thanking Professor Jerry Flores and Professor Doug Rivers, who are going to be presenting today, and our GSB alumni, including Phil Ramirez and Phil Tamba and Victorious, who've been drivers of the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative and support the organization, all been. I'd also like to thank Professor, uh, Stanford former Stanford President, John Hennessy, and John Ariaga, and Mr. Johnson, who helped support this event. And GSB faculty, Wendy Greer and Wendy Rao, who've been this is the second uh, annual State of Latino Entrepreneurship uh, event. Doug and Jerry and Natasha Rodriguez are going to discuss today what the ecosystem of Latino entrepreneurs in the U.S. looks like today, the size of Latino economic opportunity, and what sets apart Latino-led growth of million dollar companies from their peers. I'd like to particularly recognize our faculty member, uh, Professor Emeritus Jerry Porras, is the co-creator and the heart and soul of the, this initiative. Jerry has a passion for advancing Latino entrepreneurship and Latino careers that is truly inspiring. And Slay's executive education program focuses on Latino owned companies and the research that you're going to hear about today, both of which are conducted here at the business school are really realizations of his vision for Latinos helping to drive economic growth and prosperity in this country. The business school, we are excited to continue to support SLAY as they aid academia and the world better understand the Latino entrepreneurship domain and for Stanford to help lead the way in creating a better future for our country with successful Latino entrepreneurs as a pillar of our economy. Thank you for being here. I look forward to seeing all the research that has been completed. Thank you, Dean Levin. Uh, now let's go ahead and take some time this morning to understand a little bit about how this research began and how this whole program began. And with that, I think the best person to do that is the, the founder of this organization. Also, uh, as we described, was also the professor emeritus of the Stanford Graduate School of Business and, and the chairman of, of LBAN. I'm sorry, so I'm sorry. 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 i am sorry 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 i really has been driven uh, by two very powerful realities that are going on right now. Uh, one is the population growth of Latinos. Uh, currently, to repeat some statistics that many of you probably already know, uh, currently 17% of the population in the United States is Latino. By the year 2060, that's expected to be 30%. So this is a growing uh, segment of the society, uh, both from the perspective of consumptions, consumers, and also from the over in the perspective of, of, of labor so, and providing the labor force that's needed uh, for the society to prosper. A second important effect that's going on is the growth of Latino businesses. Uh, over the last 15 years, every five years, one million new Latino businesses have been added to the total group. Now, given that a lot of uh, businesses fail, and there are estimates that 20 to 30 percent fail each year, then the total growth is more than a million, but the net growth is a million. So every five years, the number of Latino businesses is increasing by about a million. Today, it's estimated that a little over four million Latino businesses exist. This is a growing segment uh, of the business community. So these two factors really led us to 
create first Latino Business Active Network, and then out of that create uh, this, uh, the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative, which we call SLED. I want to give you a little <coughs> history of it so you can put uh, the effort uh, today in perspective and put it in the context of all of the things that you think need to be done in order to really strengthen this country by uh, improving and promoting Latino entrepreneurship and the success of Latino in business. So what is SLED? SLED is a collaboration between Stanford and the Latino Business Action Network. So Stanford and, 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 and LBAN have come together uh, to create this organization that we call SLED, this initiative that we call SLED. It all began back in 2012 <clears throat> when I was meeting uh, with a group of, of Latino MBA alums, which had been mentioned by John, and we were talking about what is it that's going on in the country, and more importantly, what can we do to contribute uh, to give back to the Latino community and, and also to, to really strengthen the country by giving back to the Latino community. That, that sort of has been our, our perspective, that, that helping the Latino community develop and grow is in the context of helping the whole country become strong. So the focus is, is really on strengthening uh, the country. Out of, that, out of that meeting came LBAN, Latino Business Action Network, a 501c3 organization, a nonprofit organization. And as uh, those of you who have uh, read Bill's last know that I'm really big on, uh, on the notion of purpose of an organization. <clears throat> so the purpose of LBAN, in terms of its long-term, 100-year uh, goal, if you will, was to strengthen the country by improving the lives of Latinos. Very simply put. And a lot of things can be done to improve the lives of Latinos. But the end goal for doing that is really to strengthen the country. That's the end result of improving the lives of Latinos. More specifically then, uh, the creation of SLEG was focused on improving the lives of Latinos by really focusing on Latino-owned companies, and specifically on helping to create large Latino-owned companies. At present, there are about, as I said, about 4 million Latino-owned companies. Less than 2% of them gross over a million dollars a year. So Latinos seem to like to start companies, but are unable to really grow big ones at a very high rate. So our focus was to say, let's promote the growth of those big ones. And that's what this collaboration with SLAY is all about. So in order to do that, we came up with ideas of what are the major thrusts that we could develop. And the first one was that we should do education. We should create ed educational programs to help Latinos learn how to grow big companies, to provide support of various sorts, and I'll elaborate on what we came up with, to do that. The second was on research. Let's create a research program. One that would start with building a database of Latino home companies. And out of that, draw samples to do annual research on them, to try to find out exactly what their state is and what their problems are, et cetera. Specifically, and most importantly, around what are, what, what are the barriers to their growth? What's keeping them from growing? What's keeping them from really being big? We wanted to understand that more, believing that if we understood it, then more informed decision making uh, could be done by policymakers, both in, in government and in business. The third component of our efforts was the development of a stronger ecosystem to support Latino businesses and the entrepreneurs. The ecosystem is extremely important as a component for what's going to determine the success of any business. And the ecosystem surrounding Latino-owned businesses is not all that strong and needs to be made stronger. So we wanted to contribute to that. So let me just say a little bit more about our educational program because it's, uh, it's not something that you'll hear about today because we're going to focus mainly on the research dimensions of what it is that we've been doing. We uh, partnered with Huggy Rao, uh, who is a professor here in the business school, and he and Bob Sutton, who is a professor in the School of Engineering, have created <coughs> an online program that focuses on scaling companies. And since that fit exactly what our goal was, well, we collaborated with them, and Huggy was very enthusiastic about championing this, to create a program that was customized to focus on the needs of the Latino entrepreneur. 
So the online program is six weeks long. Um, at the beginning of the program, the students come to Stanford for two days, and at the end, they come back for one day. So we have this sort of bookends of uh, visits here to Stanford. Today, oh, we offer that, this program twice a year, in the, in the spring and late spring and in the fall. Uh, today, we have been averaging roughly 240 applicants for 80 positions. Uh, of the uh, 80 people who enter the program, we've had a graduation rate of about 92%, which for an online program, those of you who are familiar with that, is astoundingly high. These people really drop out of online programs. We focus on, on two particular groups of, of Latino business owners. The first is, is, a, is a Latino company that has been in existence for at least three years and has had sales of at least a million dollars a year. So we're trying to focus on those companies who have reached that threshold of a million dollars. And so we're doing that to try to focus on the individual companies that have the highest probability of really being successful and growing even more. The second group that we focus on is uh, people at the startup phase, companies at the startup phase, who have raised at least a half a million dollars from outside resources. So half a million in investment funds or have achieved a million dollars in sales. The program is augmented by a series of specific activities that help develop the Latino entrepreneur. The first thing we've done is added to the program is a video series in which we interviewed 10 Latino entrepreneurs who have successfully scaled their companies. We wanted to have them explain how they were doing, how they were dealing with the various issues, and focusing on issues that every entrepreneur faces, but specifically trying to add issues that they face as Latino entrepreneurs. What might have been unique about their experiences, unique to them as Latinos. We add mentors for every student. So every student meets with a mentor online for at least one hour a week. And this has been a very powerful way of, of, of engaging a community of people who really are experienced and knowledgeable about businesses and how to run businesses and helping those Latino entrepreneurs and business owners uh, who are at their younger stage of, of growth and development. We've created webinars that focus on primarily money. There's money out there, but there's different types of money. And not every company can use or can get every type of money. So you need to know more about the types of money that's out there, and you match your own interests and your own abilities and what your company is like to that source of money. And so that's a very important educational component because as you're going to find out, uh, one of the issues around Latino entrepreneur growth is their access to money. And changing that is going to be, I think, an important component to, to assuring the future success of Latino businesses. <clears throat> we create a process in which we have the, the participants uh, uh, interacting with capital providers. <coughs> on the last day of the program, uh, we bring in about 35 capital providers, and we conduct a speed dating session in which uh, each entrepreneur gets a chance to talk to three or maybe four capital <coughs> providers about their efforts. And we're finding that deals are getting started and some deals are getting made in terms of providing capital to the participants. And finally, we create a network of the, of the participants, not only the current participants, but the alumni. So we're growing a bigger and bigger network of, of individuals that have common experience having come to this program and can begin interacting in varieties of ways. Now, one of the most important ways that they can react and interact with each other. And a mantra that we start to preach in the program is do business with each other and get business with each other. So we're trying to promote the interaction of all the participants in doing actual business with each other. Not just interacting, not just collaborating, not just talking, but actually doing business with each other. And I want to tell you a little story that happened in this last cohort that we just finished in November, <laughs> because it really symbolizes the sort of activity and energy that's just spontaneously starting to come up. We have a session in which we ask 
each of the participants to introduce themselves and talk about the business that they're, that they're in and the businesses that they have. Three seconds to do that, so it's really pretty fast. And as we were going around, uh, one person stands up and a woman says, I just founded a, a winery. And it's up in the Napa Valley. As the introduction goes on, uh, another gentleman stands up and he says, well, I have a chain of, of uh, grocery stores in Los Angeles. And then he looks at the, at the owner of the winery and he says, and I'm going to stock your wine in my grocery stores. <laughs> wow, we were surprised and amazed and impressed with that. But then a little while later, another woman stands up and says, I run a chain of restaurants in San Francisco, and we're going to put your wine on our wine list. That's what we want to have happen. We want to have more and more of that happening spontaneously, where people are not only thinking about <coughs> doing business with anybody, but doing business specifically with them. And the more that that can happen, I think that the more we'll promote the growth. In addition, like the all Latino businesses do business with other businesses that are not Latino. And in their interactions and the relationships they've built up, they recognize that the businesses that they're doing business with might have a need for something, like maybe some marketing research or maybe some legal help or maybe some accounting help, et cetera. And that there are Latino businesses that do that and they may know of them. So we'd like to have them start connecting those people to the non-Latino businesses. And that way expand uh, the business of, uh, opportunities for Latinos. So in these ways, we're trying to promote the development of a stronger and stronger uh, ecosystem uh, that surrounds the Latino business owner. Let's turn to the research. In the research, we created this database, as I mentioned, uh, well over 1.3 million people and businesses are in it. We did a survey in 2015 and had a, a report that was presented a year ago this past November. Uh, that was of about 2,000 Latino businesses. Uh, today, we're going to be commenting on, on a survey that was done of 5,000 Latino businesses, uh, one of the largest surveys of its type uh, in, in, in existence. And we'll be talking about the results of that. Now, I was pleased to see that some of the ideas that we generated and built to last are getting reflected in the data that we're finding on Latino businesses. And most specifically, and you'll hear more about this in a little bit more detail, is the issue of the impact of culture. One of the findings of the Built to Last research was that culture played an extremely important role in creating and during the great companies. These companies built strong cultures and they built them from very early on, and that these cultures really helped create a, a sharp focus for the company over the longer term and guided their behavior. And we're finding s some of these things happening with Latino businesses and things that they start doing at the very beginning really do promote their growth uh, later on. The ecosystem that we're trying to focus and build on consists of components of these efforts that I've already described. So we're trying to include mentors in the ecosystem, the capital providers in our ecosystem, the alumni, and also a lot of Latino-based or, or, or Latino-oriented organizations that are throughout the country. Like for example, the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is one, or, or trade organizations often have Latino components. Today. So we've established relationships with many of them, and we're pulling them in and trying to create a broader and bigger ecosystem. So that's what SLAY is all about. That's what SLAY has been doing uh, in our efforts in both research, <coughs> education, and an ecosystem. Building. So I want to thank you all again for being here. I hope that the information I've given you about our broad efforts will really be helpful and be useful in helping you understand uh, and put in context <laughs> what it is that we're trying to accomplish here at Stanford. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. One of the things now I want to move to is, of course, is the, the main information for the day, and that's the, the research here that we completed last year. Um, again, Jerry talked a little bit about how we just increased the size of the survey. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that what we try to do is make sure that we supplement other research that's out there. So the intent is not to recreate the wheel over and over again, but to help supplement surveys that are done by the U.S. Census, uh, by those of the Coffin Foundation and others. Uh, we try to look for those things that are uh, kind of the opportunity to provide a unique opportunity to, to, do, to 
conduct rigorous economic analysis of Latino entrepreneurs. Um, and as part of that, for anyone in the academic world, uh, that data will be open to anyone for academic uh, purposes. And that's on a, on, a, uh, on a national scale as well, so not just here in Stanford. So please uh, make sure you, you, you work with us or with, uh, with uh, Dr. Rivers and Dr. Rodriguez about uh, getting that information and making sure that we start that communication. So with that, what I'd like to do is present uh, and to uh, introduce the, the folks that are going to go through the, uh, the material this morning. So first of all is Dr. Doug Rivers. He's a critical investigator and faculty sponsor for our survey research. Uh, he's also the senior fellow at Hoover Institution and a professor of political science at Stanford. And one of the things he wants something done right to find a busy person because he's also the president and CEO of YouGov uh, slash Paul Metrics. So it's a pretty busy guy and we thank thanks Doug for, for the, the time you put in and help us with this. Uh, secondly is, uh, and next is Natasha rodriguez Ott, who's the lead research manager at, at uh, Sparta Slay. Uh, she's Stanford PhD in sociology and education policy. And Natasha coordinates and produces many of the, uh, of the reports and the information that you'll see here today. So I, again, for my, myself, thank you to both of you for the hard work I know that, that went into this and the great job that you both did in doing that. So with that, I think uh, uh, Doug's gonna start. seem to be living sometimes in a uh, fact-free universe. Um, so at the risk of boring you, I'm going to uh, introduce a few facts and some data. Um, I'm going to cover a bit of what we know about Latino entrepreneurship from um, federal statistics, uh, particularly those collected by the census, uh, which tell you pretty much the what uh, of uh, what's been happening. Um, and then the research that we've done is to try to extend that uh, to find out the why. And uh, Natasia will be covering that. Um, so just to um, so um, these are the main takeaways of uh, uh, this research. Um, Natasia will go into these in detail. Um, so let me sort of set up with uh, these um, I think we're all aware, as Jerry mentioned, of the rapid growth in the Latino population in the United States. Uh, in the 1990 census, there were uh, 22 million Latinos. Um, Ten years later, that grew to 35 million. And the most recent census was about 50 million. Um, That's the red line you can see at the top there. Um, but as rapid as the growth of the Latino population has been, uh, there's another story that hasn't been told, uh, which is the even faster rate of growth of Latino entrepreneurship. Uh, the black line in this graph shows the increase in the number of Latino businesses counted by the federal government. Uh, in 1992, there were less than one million owned businesses in the United States. Uh, in 2012, the most recent uh, data collected by the federal government, there were over 3.2 million. So uh, it tripled uh, in a period of less than a quarter century. Uh, the black line there is uh, steeper now than the red line, which means that Latino businesses are growing faster uh, than the rate of Latino population in the United States. Um, of course, nothing stands still, uh, but as I'm sure you know, the Latino population has been growing faster than other groups. So uh, going from, uh, as Jerry mentioned, about 8% of the population in uh, 1990 to about 17% of the population today, a larger fraction of the Latino population, uh, of the U.S. population is <coughs> Latino. Um, there's a somewhat different story associated with Latino businesses. Uh, in 1990, uh, about 5% of the businesses in the U.S. were Latino-owned. So there was a smaller fraction of Latino-owned businesses than there were of Latino.
casinos in the U.S. population. And that was not growing uh, particularly rapidly. Okay. Uh, so what you can see is over on the left, uh, the percent of businesses that were Latino owned was relatively flat. Uh, but then starting after 2000, there was a rapid growth in the number of Latino businesses. Um, so uh, in the 1990s, the growth rate was about 5% per year. Uh, in the 2000s, it's been uh, over 7% per year. Uh, so what that means is that the fraction of businesses that are Latino owned is catching up to the fraction of the population that is Latino. 7% growth is a massive growth rate. So imagine if we were able to grow the US economy at 7% a year. That would be truly impressive. Um, furthermore, in the midst of this period, we had a rather bad recession. The Great Recession of 2007 through 2009 was something that slowed business growth. Um, in fact, the total number of new businesses created in the U.S. between 2007 and 2012 um, was only about 300,000, about a 2% growth rate. Essentially, you had uh, a flat rate of growth uh, of business creation in that period. Um, it's not widely known, but over the period from 2007 to 2012, the number of Latino businesses grew by a rate of 47%. Over a million Latino-owned businesses were created between 2007 and 2012. That's a remarkable number, given uh, the economic environment of that period. Uh, in fact, if you eliminate the Latino-owned businesses from the number of businesses created, the U.S. economy would have had fewer businesses 2012 than it had in 2007. Contrary to what you may have heard, uh, Latinos are not a drag on the U.S. economy. If anything, the U.S. economy has been a drag on Latino businesses. Um, as good as that news is, however, uh, there's still a lot of room. Um, so what we've been doing is, is, in particular, looking at the nature of these businesses. What industries are they in? Well, it turns out that they spread relatively evenly across uh, the businesses in the U.S. economy. There is, as not surprisingly, uh, somewhat disproportionate share in services. That's not true that these are all service businesses. Um, one of the striking things we've seen, though, is that the uh, growth rate of these businesses is not as fast <coughs> as it is for non-Latino businesses. And that is, Latino-owned businesses are smaller on average than non-Latino-owned businesses. Um, the red bars here show the growth rates of Latino-owned businesses compared to non-Latino-owned businesses. They're about one-third the size. They're growing at uh, uh, less than half the rate in terms of revenue and employment. <coughs> Uh, lower revenues means lower employment, less profit, uh, and less wealth creation. We don't know what's uh, blocking the growth of Latino-owned businesses. Uh, that's a focus of our research and what uh, Natasia will be talking about. Uh, it's not a function of what industries are in, and certainly not a function of uh, entrepreneurial spirit, as evidenced by the uh, large number of Latino-owned businesses that have been created. But the fundamental problem remains that Latino businesses are smaller and growing uh, more slowly than non-Latino businesses. Uh, to quantify this, uh, we did a, a calculation, which is a thought experiment, saying what would happen if Latino-owned businesses were as large or growing as quickly as non-Latino-owned businesses. So from 2002 to 2012, um, the growth was large, 200 billion in revenue to 500 billion. However, what's, what's possible uh, beyond what we're seeing? Uh, in particular, uh, suppose Latino businesses had the same average revenues as non-Latino businesses. What that would have meant is that 500 uh, billion would have grown to 1.9 uh, trillion dollars in 2012. That is almost quadrupling uh, of the amount of revenue um, 
that would have had an enormous impact on employment uh, and on the overall economy. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Natasia, who um, took over the running of the uh, uh, Slay survey this year. She joined the project uh, last summer um, and uh, is collecting uh, fascinating data about you know, businesses that will help fill in our understanding. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so as, um, as Dr. Rivers stated, we begin our research in reaction to a lack of in-depth quality information on Latino entrepreneurs and their businesses and why this opportunity gap exists. In 2016, we conducted a national survey of Latino entrepreneurs where we asked them about their businesses and the, the, about the characteristics of themselves. Our goals were to answer questions such as, what types of financial capital do Latino firms use? What communities are Latino firms serving? And what traits best characterize the Latino businesses that are able to scale, which we define as reaching $1 million or more in annual revenue? So I'll be presenting key findings in these areas based on analyses of the national survey. Let's start by talking about business funding. One of the most commonly held views as to why Latino firms aren't able to grow and why this opportunity gap exists relates to their ability to get financial resources. Here we have graphics showing the number of funding sources businesses use at two distinct stages, the earlier startup stage on the left and the growth stage on the right. Let's start by looking at the use of startup funds by Latino firms. Firms that are now scaled, which are firms that are over a million dollars or more in revenue, or at or over a million dollars in revenue, are represented by the inner circle. And firms that are not scaled are represented by the outer circle. We find that 58%, close to 60% of scaled firms report that they use at least two funding sources at the startup stage, compared to only 45% of unscaled firms. This, to us, suggests a relationship between using more funding sources at an early stage and being scaled later on in a, in a, business's, in a business's life course. So keep in mind that in our analysis, we account for differences such as industry type and differences in company age. So these aren't likely to explain these differences in the types of funding that businesses report, report using. Looking now at the use of funds for business growth, the chart on the right, we see a very similar pattern in the number of funding sources used by scaled and unscaled firms. That is, the scaled firms continue to use more sources of funding than unscaled firms at the growth stage. It's also worth noting here that we don't see a jump in the number of sources used by Latino firms. We would expect that at once firms reach the growth stage, we'd see an increase in the number of, firm, number of funding sources they're reaching out to in the different types. But we don't see that here. We see pretty much a consistency between the startup and growth stage in the number of funds they use. Next, we looked at, into the types of funding sources that businesses used. We find that 50% of all Latino firms use only internal funding sources to start their business. This means that 50% of firms use just sources such as their personal savings, money from family and friends, or inheritance. The other 50% use some, sort, some mix of internal and external sources, where external refers to sources such as venture capital funding, angel investors, business bank loans, government loans, et cetera. <coughs> now, we know that external sources of financial capital are crucial to helping a business scale. And when a company moves from the start to the growth stage, we would hope that more companies would start to use these external sources of capital. We find that whether a firm took external funding in the startup stage is statistically related to their likelihood of taking external funding in the growth stage. That is, we find of the businesses that use no external capital to start their business, the dot shown in red here, 30% go on to use external capital at the growth stage. Comparatively, of the businesses that use some form of external capital early on at the growth stage, the dot shown in blue, 75%, more than double the number, 75% went on to use external capital at the growth stage. This suggests that owners using, who use external funding sources early on and create that culture of reaching out externally for, for financing are to, to somewhat at an advantage or able to scale their business. Clearly, funding patterns, even just at the start of a business's life course, are relevant to pay attention to because of this relationship to funding opportunities they take later on. 
Let's look more in more detail at the most common sources of funding. So we collected information on a variety of funding sources, some of which we show here. And I would like to spotlight three in particular. First, the use of personal funds by scaled and unscaled firms. We find that personal funds are the most common source of internal financing, um, financing and one of the most common sources of financing in general reported by Latino firms. Over half of businesses at the startup and growth stage report using these personal funds, so using funds from their family, friends, or their own personal savings. And this goes for both scaled and unscaled firms. Second, when we turning now to the external sources of funding, we see that business and bank loans are the most common source of external funding that businesses use. The proportion of businesses using businesses or bank loans actually doubles from the started to growth stage for unscaled businesses and even triples for the businesses that are scaled. Third, looking next at hard money, which tends to be a more expensive form of financial capital for businesses, we find that the, um, the opposite. So we find that unscaled businesses are more likely to take this more expensive form of capital than the scaled businesses. Next, let's look at where Latino businesses are located around the United States. Almost 60% of Latino businesses can be found in just four states, California, Florida, Texas, and New York. The five cities with the largest concentrations of Latino businesses are, perhaps unsurprisingly, located within those states. One in nine of all Latino firms is located in one of these five cities. These geographic concentrations of Latino businesses map fairly well onto the largest concentrations of, Latino, of the Latino population. However, the mapping, the mapping is not one-to-one. -one. That is, there are some states where there are more or fewer Latino businesses relative to what we'd expect based on the population size in that state. For example, Florida contains 8.5% of the Latino population, but 12% of, all, of all Latino firms in the US. Meanwhile, across the country, 27% of the U.S. Popu Latino population resides in California, but only 22% of U.S. Latin Latino firms are in California. The implication here is that the distribution of the Latino population, it does not necessarily dictate the distribution of Latino firms. We explore this finding further by looking into exactly who it is Latino businesses are serving. And contrary to popular belief, we find strong evidence that Latino businesses are well integrated into the U.S. economy. 75% are located in zip codes outside of, of majority Latino communities. 75% serve mostly non-Latino clients, and 50% employ mostly non-Latino workers. And this shows us that Latino firms are not operating in a bubble, that they're, in fact, well integrated into the general U.S. economy and serving more than just their fellow Latino people. One possibility is that this integration of firms is limited to the larger companies, the scaled firms. But importantly, we find that this is not the case. In other research, we find that these percentages look very similar for, for scaled and for unscaled companies. So this dispels the notion that perhaps the unscaled Latino businesses are stuck in, stuck, quote unquote, in uh, um, smaller Latino neighborhoods serving a limited population, unable to expand their clientele. Because of our strong interest in learning more about scaled companies, we also examine the distribution of scaled Latino businesses across the US. The numbers in black boxes here indicate the proportion of scaled firms in the US that are located in different states. We see, for, um, for instance, that the Latino business economy is flourishing in Florida. 12% of Latino businesses are in the state, but 18% of, of US scaled Latino firms are located in Florida. In California and Texas, on the other hand, we find that million dollar companies, these scaled companies, are underrepresented relative to what we'd expect. 40% of Latino businesses are located in those two states, but only 26% of scaled Latino businesses are located in those states. What is it that separates firms, such as those in Florida, where there's a high concentration of scaled firms, versus um, Texas, um, firms such as those in Texas, where we see a low concentration of scaled firms relative to firms in general? Well, one, one thing that we find is different is their use of financial capital, and particularly their use of external financial capital. 60% of firms in Texas use external funds to grow, to grow their business, compared to 80% of the scaled firms in Florida. The difference in use of external funds um, we see even begins at the startup phase, so this isn't just a difference in funds to grow, 
also to start their businesses. We find that close to 50% of the scaled firms in Texas used external funds to start, compared to 70% of the scaled firms in Florida. It's possible that um, there's a number of different reasons why this could be. A couple that we posit would be that it's, it's possible there's a culture of using external sources in, um, in some states where you have more, more scaled firms in general and more scaled firms that are using external capital. Another alternative is that there could be networks here. So businesses are seeing other businesses that they work with and do business with take on these external sources. And so this is something that we plan to look more into in our future research. Now, most of the presentation thus far has been focused on characteristics of Latino businesses. I want to next turn to characteristics of the business owners themselves, and specifically the, char the characteristic of being immigrant generation, generation in the US. We find that 61% of Latino business owners are immigrants or children of immigrants. Specifically, around 30% of Latino entrepreneurs report being born abroad, and another 30% report that their parents were born abroad, they were born here. This clearly shows that Latino immigrant families make, us, make up a substantial share of Latino entrepreneurs and are not to be ignored. Their share of owners of scaled businesses is even more striking. Among firms with a million dollars or more in revenue, we find 42% of entrepreneurs are immigrants. Among firms with 50 or more employees, an alternative measure of scale, we find that close to the, the proportion that are born abroad is even higher, that close to 50% are immigrants. The overrepresentation of Latino immigrants among owners of scaled businesses suggests that Latino immigrants are job creators and are making a positive contribution to the US economy. Given the substantial portion of business owners who are immigrants, we took a closer look at the characteristics of those immigrants to see if those immigrant owners differed in other ways aside from their country of birth than um, compared to the other Latino firm owners. Some of the findings here include that Lat Latino immigrants are less likely to report their personal goals, goals standing in the way of their business's growth compared to the non-immigrant owners, pointing to a unique spirit and optimism that they may operate with. Additionally, we find that immigrant owners tend to be older, more educated, and typically are more likely to be running an existing family business than the owners that were born in the US. The knowledge and experience from these ties and education Potentially could point to, um, potentially could be related to their overrepresentation among scaled business owners. This is something else we'd like to look into moving forward. So, I think the takeaway here is that even though these immigrant entrepreneurs are new to the country, they're not necessarily new to the business world. They're coming with experience and knowledge about how to run a business. Let's recap the main findings. We find that Latino firms are distributed across the U.S and serve more than just Latino people. They do not operate in an independent economy that's segmented from the rest, but instead are integrated into the broader economy in terms of the people served and the locations where, they, where we can find them. Additionally, immigrants are overrepresented among scaled firms. This sheds light on the positive impact of Latino immigrants in particular among business owners and that they're having on the economy, and reveals the need to explore what sets these immigrant entrepreneurs apart and how we can help other entrepreneurs in the US too. Finally, we find that scaled firms receive more external funding and are, and are promoting um, a culture of early stage external um, financing, so that they're looking for external financing earlier on, and this is, it's, this is potentially related to their ability to succeed in scaling later in their life course. And this opens the door for us to understand why some Latinos are able to scale and others do not, and possibly look into the implications for the opportunity gap and how we can help smaller Latino businesses to increase their total sales and size in general. So in closing, I want to emphasize that we see our work here just getting started. We already have set up several follow-up surveys to our 5,000 Latino entrepreneurs that were initially surveyed, and we plan to further investigate these topics as well as others, including like gender differences across entrepreneurs. Additionally, I want to encourage everyone to take a look at our full report, which goes live today, and everyone will be receiving a link uh, post-event. It will be available through the Stanford Graduate School of Business website and contains details on these, on these findings and others that we weren't able to talk about today. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Rivers and Dr. Rodriguez Ott. Uh, it's a great job in, in putting this information together, and I know how difficult it is to, to crawl through all of this and find where is the significant data in, in uh, the mountains of information that I know that you, that you can collect in the process. So um, again, thanks for the, for the great job in doing that. So one of the things that, that comes out of that, though, is you start looking at the, at the information or the data that you look at and, and, and trying to make sense of that um, and implications of where this is going next is, is what our next two speakers are going to be able to cover. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Rupert Murdoch and Mr. Sol Trujillo, who we join and will be uh, up here on stage to discuss some of this uh, information as well as some other observations on uh, the U.S. economy as well. So. Thank you, Phil. I want, to, uh, I want to start where Rupert and I, we've known each other for a while. We were business partners in a cable company in, in Australia. Since then, we've stayed in touch, and we've, we have lots of conversations about lots of things. The economy, technology, occasionally politics, uh, and, and a lot of things, and Rupert, uh, I won't spend a lot of time introducing him, but I'm going to introduce him in my way. And one of the things that I think is important with the SLAY initiative that we have going here is I would like everybody in this country and around the world to, to think when they see this word Latino and they think about a synonym, one of the synonyms is entrepreneurs because the data shows that essentially if you do the math you divide the total number of population you know by number of people in a household you'd see that almost one in a one out of every four households essentially owns a business if you're a Latino kind of family now what's the relevance to Rupert Murdoch well, for me, Rupert represents, again, he's, he's almost by name synonymous with being a true entrepreneur. If you look at his history in terms of starting in his native country uh, in the publishing business, newspaper business, and how he expanded there, how he expanded there into this other English-speaking country called uh, the United Kingdom, or it's more than a country, but, but the whole region there. And then obviously his big bets on into the US in terms of scaling an enterprise, which was relatively sizable in Australia, but all the time thinking about scaling up and, and this notion of scaling involves expertise. It involves essentially a risk appetite. And in Rupert's case, he's made some of the biggest bets I've ever seen anybody in business ever make in a personal way. And it also means staying current with all the attendant issues that you have in whatever business or sector that you operate or compete in. And so when you think today about 21st Century Fox in terms of what it encompasses, I would encourage all of you to go online and just look at 21st Century Fox and see the enterprise that he's built, but starting from where he started and essentially exemplifying what we're talking about here and so when I think about entrepreneurship, I think about, again, knowledge about something. If you're going to start a business, you better know something about that business. Number two, you better have some continuous learning capabilities, which is what we're doing here at SLAY, as Dr. Porras talked about. And the third thing, which is the most difficult 
almost non-controllable variable at start is this notion of capital and how you leverage capital over time as you continue to scale a business. So I say all of that in terms of introduction of, of Rupert because Rupert has, has done all the above. He's done it at a smaller scale. He's done it at a massive scale. He's had to, through the businesses that he covers, and, and you know one of my favorite publications, you'll see me walk around almost every day with this publication because it's a global view of what's happening and it's about as independent a view as there is in today's media environment. And what I mean by that is that if you look today, you might see something here that says, dollar sinks as Donald Trump talks it down. Is that a positive or is that a negative, right? You don't know unless you read the story because there are always pluses and minuses to almost everything. And if you were to read the Wall Street Journal religiously, and I'm not doing a commercial for, for Rupert, he didn't ask me to do this. <laughs> if you read the Wall Street Journal, you will be able to see more coverage of Latinos and their importance to our economy than any other publication out there. And I mean it, you know, because this is, this is both digital and, and uh, analog version, right? And, and I can say that if you look at editorial policy, you will see, again, more coverage about the importance of Latinos in the Wall Street Journal. And I say that only because this gentleman, along with his leadership team, they spend time trying to understand data, trends, facts, and other things. So I'd like to just start off this way by giving this background about Rupert Murdoch, who's, who, who really does care about ways that we can grow the economy. And he cares about it in a, in a way that, that is important to our country. And so Rupert and I have had a lot of conversations probably over the last four years, five years, about this. I mean, uh, so we've spent a lot of time and he's engaged his leadership people within his company uh, to, to make sure that they understand. So I say all of that and ask all of you to help me welcome up here Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> now, Rupert, I, I want to start by by asking you just this broad question about entrepreneurship and why you think entrepreneurship is, is important you know, for any country, why it's important for almost any community as you think about it, and why it's important for each of us as individuals to understand it. I should first thank you for the welcome. Anyway, a lot of flattery, but uh, <laughs> it goes well. It's all truth. It's all truth. Uh, uh, <coughs> You asked about entrepreneurship. I mean, it's the fundamental thing that is going to create, not only good for the people who en en uh, engage in it, but opportunities for everybody. And I think it's, it's just a very basic chance we have for growing an economy. And I think we're all very lucky to be in America where there's a better climate for entrepreneurs than anywhere else in the world. Um, certainly for uh, immigrants who come here, and we're going to talk about some handicaps that exist, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, there's no one, if you go to any country in the world, there are people who want to come and live here and take advantage of it and grow. And I think that's a wonderful thing for America. Now, of course, at the moment, it's overwhelmingly the question of Latino immigrants and how you know, they've got to be helped. Um, I think public education is a huge issue in this country. Uh, <clears throat> I think the access to capital for small people is another equally huge issue. But we'll come to those. Well, so, so Rupert, as you think about your engagement with us here today, and, and you know, your firm has committed some resources in support of, 
the initiative here. Why, why are you even here today? Why are you committed to this notion of, of entrepreneurship, growing companies, understanding more, et cetera? I think it would be helpful to, to understand that, why a guy like you would, would even be spending time on this. Because I really want the Stanford people to hear this. Well, I'm in the business of communications. You know, I started with a small newspaper, got some more, realized that there's great transformation coming, so we got into television. Television in Australia, in those days, you were really taking what you were fed from America. So long term, the idea, um, first to get out of Adelaide, have a network, and then um, to get at the source of it, which was the studios in, in, in Hollywood. That was how we got into those things. But if you're in media, you have newspapers, you have news channels and things, you have a responsibility. And I'm lucky, I was brought up by a father who was a, uh, an editor and a journalist. It's natural for me to be interested and very understanding of the responsibility one has uh, to partake in sort of debates about public policy. So, so, so talking then more specifically about the Latino population in the U.S. and in particular this, this notion of this growing um, tsunami, let's call it, of Latino entrepreneurs, how, how do you think about it? If you were sitting down with Donald Trump today and you were trying to help him understand this, what would, what would be the key insights that you've picked up over the last several years looking at it and through the eyes of your editors and reporters and other people that do their own independent research? Well, I think I'd show him. <clears throat> I've tried already, but uh, to get his attention. If you're going to get a recovery and you're going to get growth, you have to get the formation, mass formation of small businesses. I think uh, history shows that how we came out of depressions and recessions in the past, it is always led by the formation of small businesses. Um, and you know, he can make some political statements about getting forward for a thousand jobs or 10,000. Uh, <clears> You've <throat> got to understand that the jobs are really going to come from small business and to create an atmosphere for growth. I think the biggest thing, bigger than taxes almost, is deregulation. But if you get corporate taxes down, and that would apply to small businesses too, then that will also be a magnet for people here and an encouragement to get started. Uh, I'm Part of the reason why Rupert and I chat periodically is I do, wherever I've been around the world, I've proclaimed myself as a capitalist, as a market-based person, because I, I believe that markets work 92.5% of the time. Right, not a hundred percent of the time, because there's there's always frailties sure. in in almost anything. But I think Rupert's point about you know small medium-sized businesses for the last three decades, over seventy percent of all new jobs created have been but not been created by the big companies like the ones I've run or Rupert runs, but they're really created by you know small medium-sized businesses. And so that focus is important, and that's why the work here at Stanford uh, is important, just reinforcing Rupert's point. But, but one of the things, Rupert, that you saw in, in the presentation and the data is that Latino-owned businesses, they're proliferating, right? And part of the good news of that that we don't cover so much at the Stanford level in terms of our research is that those people that are maybe creating a business that's generating $100,000, $150,000 of revenue, and maybe they're taking home eighty dollars or $90,000 of profit, that means I'm earning an income that doesn't put me on some sort of you know, uh, a okay. welfare or whatever it might be in terms of support. And that's really important when we think about GDP and productivity and and kind of all the driver variables as, as we grow an economy. And so one of the things, though, that has been pointed out is that, yes, volume is growing, and it's growing at a high rate, but the attainment levels are not quite the same. And one of the things that's starting to emerge from year one research, year two research, 
is this notion of other sources of capital besides what I can pull out of my credit card and friends and family, et cetera. And Latinos are not networked well enough into other sources of capital. There are not funds targeted yet here in a prolific way, and there's some people here in the room that are starting funds and, and getting into that business today. But this notion of capital and access to capital, networking, and I'm not talking about government programs. I'm talking about just the way markets work. Sometimes if you're not familiar when you're going to enter India or you know, Indonesia or someplace, you, you create a network, you create relationships. And, and people know, you know, people that have capital and there's people that are seeking capital, you know, you can, you can broker those kinds of marriages through awareness and knowledge, data that tracks how performance is. What, what do you think would be helpful as we think about strategies of cre creating this networked visibility, accessibility to those sources of capital that seem to work well for, for what you might call the traditional categories of people, but Latinos in particular don't seem to have them yet. And we're going to do more research around it. But, but any thoughts there? Well, I don't really understand that because I think what we're talking about with Latinos and Catholicism, it's a cultural thing too that make them entrepreneurs. They want to get their families to do better. Uh, it's not a selfish thing totally at all. Um, and I think that's, I don't understand why people don't network better because maybe <clears throat> our churches are not as strong as they used to be. Uh, and those sort of community organizations have fallen down a bit in, a, in most Western countries. Um, so maybe we can do more at that level. I mean, can we, you know, with, with young people, with youths, get them together more? Um, yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the things, uh, if you went through the data, you saw the, this example of Florida versus Texas for Latinos. So two things stood out. One was that in Florida, the percentage of millennials as entrepreneurs was you know, significantly higher than in Texas, where they tended to be older. Interesting data point, which may be correlating to average age you know, located in Florida of Latinos. Don't know that. I don't know that. Is it, is it Cubans and their background in Cuba? That come, they're refugees in a sense. Politically, they might have lost their business, their families. Um, and, uh, you know, they've lost everything, come here, try to start again. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, are they, do they hold together better? Because they are refugees, political refugees. Um, and um, my, my, are they educated better in Florida than they are? In my, my personal view, uh, this is a personal view. We don't have the data yet, but we're going to get it in our next uh, wave of research uh, is that in in Florida and in particular in Miami the first generation of, of let's call them refugees right people that literally left the country they were business owners as you said they they had education they had a lot of things maybe they didn't have the money that was in the bank when they left in their pocket but they had all the knowledge and expertise right. and they had the networks Right. If I used to be the banker and I used to be the construction company and I used to be the doctors and all that, they all got together, networked and they operated much like what we all either publicly or maybe not so publicly talk about, like the Jewish community has in various places where they've immigrated from and to where they network, they support each other, they make capital available, they do all that sort of thing. And in Miami, I think that's really, truly the case. But now it's happening with the millennials, right? Where the millennials, because their parents might have done that, they're now proliferating it by using all kinds of traditional, in today's context, traditional sources of capital. But, but in other parts like Texas or even California, it's not quite happening at the same rate. So we need to get the data 
But I'm a believer that, like with anything, if you're launching a new TV show in the fall, you have to promote it, right, so that people are aware of its existence in order for them to want to watch it, right? And in this case, the story about Latinos as entrepreneurs, the story about them in ter terms of their growth rates, et cetera, is something that I would like to personally see more funds evolve. If you look at the venture capital world here in the Silicon Valley, and you did a survey of them, nobody has done this because it's all you know, fairly private, uh, and you saw uh, in reverse a survey of Latinos that are getting funding from venture capital, you'd see it's very, very, very small. And part of that may be awareness, just it's awareness. I don't think they're you know, biased against Latinos. They don't do Indians, they don't do people who walk in, if the idea is good. Yeah. Um, I really think a lot of it, if you're talking about mass of people, I come back to education. I guess the biggest particular group of Latinos would be in sort of greater Los Angeles, south of there. That is the single worst school district in America by a fair margin. Chicago is probably second, New York third. It's a, t you know, they're turning out kids Colin graduates, they can't read or write. They're terrible schools. Um, and people have to, we have to get that right. Um, well, one, one, one of the good things, though, that, that is happening, and, and I think you're, you're right, Rupert, in the macro sense. Then they might stick together more. See, there are other things that are hugely transformational in society at the moment. You know, from newspapers, they're, they're against the wall at the moment. Um, <coughs> No, a television. The thing that's happening, <coughs> uh, where's the, where do get people get their entertainment, where they get their news from? The answer is Facebook or, or Google, which cuts right across everything. It doesn't com bring any sense of community at all. Um, I, I know, you know, <coughs> where to get their escapism, at least you get on television. Yeah, there's still a lot of that, but it's older. Um, you're going to find young people are going to get go to sort of videos or Snapchat. All these things are happening very, very fast. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, there's there's new ways of networking, and that's the interesting thing about some of our research this year is that if you see that in Florida, it's heavily predominated by millennials in terms of a higher percentage. They're probably using these social tools to essentially create awareness, to create networks, to do other things that may be a more uh, difficult process in what I would call more the analog world of going to a traditional venture capital, maybe trying to get private equity if you're growing fast enough and you need larger chunks of capital. Um, and or, you know, it's the old story that it depends on my growth rate as to whether I'm gonna get an angel I have to be old enough to get a bank loan. Right. And then, you know, I have to essentially have higher growth rates or be in what I would call comfortable sectors for VCs, in particular tech VCs, to want to be interested. So, you know, as you, as you think about it, if somebody came to you and, and said, Rupert, we're trying to solve this conundrum, prolific growth in numbers, not having essentially enough attainment. And it's not necessarily the businesses are failing, but they're being stymied by capital availability. Sure. What, what would you th speculate or think about that says, gee, I think we should do, we, if, if you were in charge of this initiative, what would you think we should be doing? I don't think it's just a Latino problem. I think it's. <clears throat> And very hard for very small businesses to get started. Not just all the regulations, you've also got you know, what's happened to the banks and the lending since the Dodd-Frank bill. And it's it, big banks are being stood over by the big ones, by the Fed, saying, you know, look at your risk portfolio, get your capital base up, get your profits up. They're not in the business of lending to small people. Um, not in the business of getting mortgages to small people. Uh, the small regional banks have you know, they've been f wiped out very, very largely. 
um, we have to turn that back. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, again, facilitating a, what used to be a traditional source of capital. Absolutely. A Frank Giannini, Bank of, old beginnings of Bank of America yes. story. Sure. Right? I once Small loans to people starting. Yeah, I was once upon a time on that board, and it was interesting it, when it was in San Francisco uh, to see the culture about helping Californians grow. Sure. Uh, and that is stymied because I've also been on the board, an investor, in a Latino-owned bank in LA, largest market, et cetera, yep. et cetera. And when Dodd-Frank passed, we essentially had to start acting like Bank of America and Wells Fargo. Right. Because of all the compliance requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, all the Latinos that thought they could get a loan from a Latino, essentially owned, controlled bank, se cambió, right? It changed for everybody. Sure. And, and so that, that, is, that is important. So again, taxes, so that when you think about cash flow, regulations, when you think about speed and lowering your cost of operation. You know, if someone started up and wanted to start a Bodega somewhere in, in New York, I guarantee you okay, well over 18 months to get into business. You've got feds, you've got the city, they'll, make, they'll be inspecting you for months at a time, the state. It's endless. People just say, oh, to help with it. Okay. So that's a, a real debt. I mean, we'll have to bring that back in waves. But I think we, this new administration going in certainly intends to deregulate a lot of fronts. And they've got, I think, very good intentions on public education. We'll have to see what's possible. So, so Rupert, as, as you look at some of the research we did last year, because you were involved in supporting that, and, and you look at the research this year, and as and I'm saying, now put on your Wall Street Journal or, or whatever specific hat, and say, gee, Saul, that's all been good, and then you've created this spotlight on Latinos and entrepreneurs, so we get that. But here's what we'd really now like to see as information about Latinos and the economy, the Latinos driving growth in the economy, so that we can achieve 3% GDP growth instead of two, right? Because I really do or think, four. Mm. yeah. I mean, I, I personally think 3% GDP growth is possible. It's not an Consistently, easy. Consistently, yes. Yeah, it's not easy, but we've got to do exactly what you said, not think about carrier and, and some of that kind of stuff. That's, that's a bit of fun. Hmm? Yeah, but really focus on this core, and this is the driver of that core of small and Mm -hmm. medium-sized businesses. So what would you like to see as a, as a news person that says, boy, if I could have this kind of data, there's a really compelling story here beyond what we've already told. I think we need more than just, I mean, to, be, to ram it a bit more than the big figures we have now. Can we really survey or sample large numbers of Latino businesses, small ones, medium-sized ones, and what have been their experiences, what have been their, their problems in getting started, you know, are they just employing family, uh, do they want money to buy at a competitor or some of the next and broaden themselves, um, what have been their problems? We need to get, I think, specific examples, I mean lots of them, to build yeah. a case. One, one of the things that uh, I did for today, but I, as you probably know, I do all the time, is uh, I like gathering factoids, right. right? Factoids about Latinos. Because as an American, I think about our economy as being so critical for our superiority in everything else we do, everything. right? Everything. So here's, I'm gonna, for everybody's benefit, but, but for yours, because some of these you've heard before, I just want to repeat these because it goes to your point. The U.S. Latino population grew from just over 12% in 2000 to nearly 18% uh, to nearly 18 in 2015. Uh, Doug covered that earlier. The U.S. Census Bureau anticipates U.S. population growth to grow by nearly 50 million people by 2050. Now think how many countries that is, sure. right? Um, Latinos are better educated than ever before. The U.S. Latino high school dropout rate 
decreased from more than 40% in 1980 to just over 10% in 2015. And closing in on the overall US dropout rate of 6.4% and continuing to decline. And this again is Census Bureau data. And Latinos are going to college. The share of Latino high school graduates going straight to college has jumped over uh, in the last 15 years, now exceeding over all US matriculation rate. So the kids that are graduating from high school at a slightly higher percent, they're going on to college, mm -hmm. which is terrific, right? For those of us that have been dealing with some of these issues for a number of years, the US Latinos are driving a large and increasing share of US economic growth, including this is out of a recent study done by the National Economic Research Associates mm -hmm. in DC. A total of US real, e real income growth, US Latinos contributed 30%, 29%, sorry, 29% of all the real income growth in the United States of America in the last decade. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, I want everybody in this room and anybody that's watching this on, you know, the streaming that we're doing. 29% of all real income growth in the United States of America over the last decade was driven by Latinos. That's going to quickly go to 35 and 40% within the next five to 10 years. That's massive, right? That's not ethnic. That's not niche. That's what I call mainstream. So when we keep going and we think about, you know, today the consumer market's about a trillion and a half dollars. It's growing at 80 to 90 billion per year. Now, what does that mean? One and a half trillion is, makes us about the 11th, 12th largest economy in the world. But it's growing as fast as India has been growing. So at the top of the class, the average age is 28 of all Latinos. And the native born average age is closer to 20. So when you think about a perfect description of a growth story for a country, what else would you like, right? And, and so, you know, those are all drivers. Obviously, it still has to be attained. And that's why this, you know, what you said at the very beginning about when we think about economic policy in the United States of America, the spotlight needs to be on this kind of stuff because this will drive millions of new jobs. It will drive, you know, billions of dollars of growth in the economy. And I can go on and on, you know, in terms of the consumption side of our economy. But, but this is really important. And, and this is why, you know, we've invited you here, Rupert, because, you, you know, for everybody in the room, Rupert, you know, his day may look like today he's talking to somebody from South Korea, the next day from China, the next day from Africa, the next day from somewhere, because of the global requirements he has as the CEO and chairman of his, of his company. Um, and, and so when we then hone in just on the US, we want to get better at telling this story getting more visibility to this story so that people are really focusing on how we catalyze more, not just pay attention, right? Because almost everybody now that you probably talk to says, yeah, I understand Latinos are growing, right? But so what? There's a lot of so what here. Mm -hmm. and, and your perspective can be helpful to us in terms of how we should talk about it, how we should research around it and get that story told through the Wall Street Journal, through, through TV shows. Sure. You know, that you all have where a Latino is the star saving the lawsuit or creating the you know, enterprise or whatever it might be that your storyline is. But, but all of that because that's all about markets. Mm -hmm. And I love this, this notion of driving everything through markets. So any commentary on that? I, I mean, think there's, you, in the media, it's certainly up to me and other people to, to, to club onto this. It's a great opportunity. But we've got to be looking for educa more educated young Latinos to come and be reporters on our television stations. They do well, then come on national cable television. 
yeah. uh, if they're of the more creative type, um, we've got to get them into into Hollywood, basically, which is very difficult. I mean, it's a, um, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to seem anti-Semitic, but it's a very Jewish type community, Hollywood. To go there and press, uh, uh, which we do, and we have some, um, but not nearly enough that of Latino actors coming up. Yeah. I would agree wholeheartedly with you, as you know, with mm. some of the conversations that we've had. Um, I'm going to open it up for at least two questions from the audience out there. And, um, and we'll start with whoever wants to. Yes, sir. So th this question is a general question. In looking at the research, startups, small businesses in California, Texas, Florida, New York, in terms of mapping, what are we doing in terms of building a network in the service jobs areas such as Oklahoma, Alabama, or other you know swing states like Ohio, where there are many Latinos and I don't want us to be ignored and encouraging building the infrastructure and the network in those states so startups could be paid attention in those areas. Well, uh, let, me, let me just say, first of all, thank you for that point. In addition to what might be a question there. Uh, and, and the question you know, that you're asking is, is you know, how can we do that? In, I think really behind the question is we should be doing that so that everybody understands the national map. And, and you can go to a Kansas, you can go to a, an Arkansas, you can go to lots of places, Oklahoma. Go where to you North, uh, North Dakota, everywhere. Yeah. Where there are opportunities, they're there. So, so your suggestion, I mean, uh, I think is a valid one. What would you suggest we do? Let me just turn it back to you. Well, can you stand up? So by the way, uh, Sal Trujillo is being honored at uh, the Silicon Valley Latino Leadership Summit in May. Oh. It's an honor to meet you here in person. What I would suggest is really collaborating with professors from those areas. And data is everything. Data is everything. And really bringing the resources together so that we can start there. That's a starting point. And uh, Dr. Porras, uh, a visionary, uh, I'm sure he has the outreach to those specific professors in those areas. Great. Jerry, you, you think this is doable? OK, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes? Hello. My name is Amy Williams. I'm with AB Unlimited Worldwide. And my question, Mr. Murdoch touched on recovery. It's, one thing, it's one thing for Latinos. It's not working. It's one thing for Latino businesses to start. Maintenance is another thing. How can we help these Latino businesses recover when they have financial disaster, when they hit roadblocks? What other programs can we try to instill, such as the Stanford Latino Entrepreneur Leadership Program, in other parts of the country so that we can maintain these small businesses? Jerry, do you want to? <laughs> I would. Jerry, do, do, you, do you or? Phil, want to talk about, about that? Because we, we have been serving businesses from around the country in the, in the program. One of, one of the things that we're doing is, Monday night, let's try this with a mic and see what works. Uh, one of the things we are doing is trying to build a, net, build a network that's beyond just Stanford. So as an example, we're working with accelerator programs at, out, of, out of Ohio, as an example. Uh, we're doing this with uh, Hispanic chambers that have built accelerator programs both in, out of Tucson, out of the Chicago area, out of uh, you know, other locations throughout. The other is also accelerator programs that are being run um, through equity funds in certain cases. This is from the, um, I can, the, the family helped me, Victor. Andy Unanue. Andy Unanue, who's, who's part of the, uh, the Goya food family that, that created that, who's got their own accelerator program for Latino firms in the food industry. So we're trying to build that network up so as we come in and we hear about companies that need help, 
we can point them to the right people, and we can cross-reference to each other. So we're trying to, right now we have a lot of single nodes and we need to build a network. So I think that's the opportunity. A shameless plug for Slow, yes. for our business, what the program did for us is really help us identify what our broken windows were so that we can improve our internal systems go. as well as our output for our clients and with our staff. So I'm really grateful to have been an alumni from Slow too. That's great. Thank that's you. great to Thank hear. You. Thank you. Yes, in the back. My name is uh, Chester Ruiz with the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. And Sal, I want to thank you for your participation with NARA over the years. And uh, my question to you is, how can we accelerate the collaboration between NARA and the real estate entrepreneurs to leverage all of their networks so that we can uh, increase uh, you know, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, again, these are all <laughs> terrific. We, we have been working very recently with Gary Acosta, who's your, you know, organization. Yeah. And, and Gary is, I mean, he's just terrific. And, and the NAREP is the, is the organization, National Association of Hispanic, real estate professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the pleasure of speaking to their national event uh, a few months ago, and I was just, they, they knocked my socks off. It was one of the most professionally done, you know, uh, annual conferences, people that are, you know, building businesses, whether it be, I mean, it's all centered around the real estate profession. <laughs> and entrepreneurs that are creating mortgage companies, creating you know, their own real estate companies, et cetera, et cetera, which was just wonderful to see. And you've seen the data about 51% of all new home mortgages in the last decade being taken out by Latino families. Right. Well, these are the people that are now what I would call the mainstream real estate organization in the country. And so we're looking to collaborate, use the data, uh, it's part of the research in the then coming that's the, year. What, the NRA you're talking of? The, no, not the NARA. Ah, sorry. The, NARA, I'm sorry. NARA. And so, so we're going to be looking to coordinate even more to get that data to show that there's entrepreneurs. The great thing is that there's entrepreneurs everywhere, every sector. We cannot be stereotypical. And, and, and the nice thing is, is that, uh, you know, there's a, a woman I met that's part of the organization there. She only has a $15 billion mortgage finance business wow. down in Orange County. Mm -hmm. I had never heard of her, never met her. Gary introduced me to her. And she's a Latina, doesn't have a college education, but she's got a PhD in real world business. And she's built this business. You go into her complex. I mean, she has all kinds of agents, you know, people online, et cetera, working. And I just was blown away by everywhere I get asked to speak now and I get to know these organizations. It's like I'm discovering all these great, talented entrepreneurs in almost every sector. So, so yes, we are going to work more closely. And... And it's a great story. And one of the things that I'll talk to Gerard and to even Paul and Pope some Pope others, because mm -hmm. there's so many great stories mm -hmm. about people bootstrapping their business like you sure. did and, and making it big. Thank you. Maybe one more question. This, this, is, a, this is a private, uh, this is a question. Specifically for you. If you seen this day today and you were a new entrepreneur, a Latino entrepreneur, what business would you start? Where would you start it? And how would you network it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I do, but others do. I mean, clearly, uh, is it, there's a huge opening for people in building houses and, and you know, contracting work. Uh, I mean, if you're more ambitious, I mean, you need a little bit of capital if you're going to start a, a vineyard or you're going to start a, uh, uh, I don't know. But I think you can see it. I mean, people, are, uh, uh, there's just a lot of room 
If we get a growth economy going again, if we've got a growing population, serving that population, particularly if you're one of them, uh, you take advantage of that, as you say, networking. Uh, but I'm sure that, look, if we can get the economy growing, you'll all be a big part of it in causing that. Uh, the opportunities will lift everybody up and they'll be much better. But you should all remember the heart of Kaplan, it also, an entrepreneurship is, is risk. You've got to have the courage to take risks. And people fail. I've damn nearly failed two or three times. Uh, and had to dig myself, take years to dig myself out of holes. Uh, but, you know, that's the nature of it. You can't complain about that. Now, you, you partnered up with NPN for uh, Mundo Fox, is that correct, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, yeah, I think that's over now. Mm -hmm. Didn't work. But you, but you branched out to culture and oh, actually sure. tried to Columbia. create mm -hmm. uh, a, a in-between, not a Spanish station, not an English station, but someone in between. So I applaud you for that. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great, I, I got interviewed a lot you know, by them, but I wanted to know how you were looking at the Latin culture and said, I need to do this. Why did you do that? Where, where was your... I sure understand the Latin culture totally. No, we're looking to, we're looking to try and learn about it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we, we need to move on and, and Mr. Murdoch has some other commitments, but no, it's uh, fine. if you want to take another question or two, sure. we, okay, yeah. great. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm Jorge with the Mid-Atlantic Hispanic Chamber in Washington, D.C. I have several chambers. One is uh, the level of education that the Hispanic community, Hispanic children are getting all over America. Somebody already mentioned that the poorest school districts are in areas, in the barrios where Hispanic children live. So high school education is not anymore a ticket for success in America. It can be if you're a good business person, but most people don't have the knack for business. So you're not employable at a high level if you don't have more than, more than high school education. The other thing is where your education is. The future of America is STEM technologies, you know? And if we don't go in that direction, and it's just, you know, learning to be, uh, a teacher in Spanish and all of that, yeah, that gives you a living, but it doesn't ensure success. At the end of the day, it's more than just business. It's lifting an entire Hispanic community to, to be as productive, as resourceful, and as successful as the rest of America. I'm not speaking just about Hispanics. African Americans, it's a disaster what is happening. You know, we live in areas in, in D.C., Baltimore, where essentially they are ghettos. I mean, most African Americans will, re, will are not uh, will resent using that phrase. But the reality is, drug addiction, uh, lack of education, lack of housing. You know, it seems to be to be many Hispanics in our area say, you know, what is wrong with this picture in America? You know, because we don't we grew up in a country where in countries where you didn't have that problem. So. My question is, where, uh, what, what we need to do to really push the Hispanic community? If you build, a, like the Jewish community, if you have a, a, a community that embraces lifelong learning, not just hard work, hammering all day may be admirable, but that doesn't get you too far. You know, that allows you to use the knowledge you have, useful knowledge, for whatever endeavor you choose in life. Uh, what do we need really to do? Where do we need to start? Business is important. I'm president of a chamber. I'm an advocate for all the things, but I need to learn from you. Well, what was the reason for your success? Mr. Murder? No, well, I think, no. It's, um, well, I was lucky I had a sort of decent education, but um, not that I was a great issue. I don't think, look, you know, college and universities are fine, and that's good. But just mentioned that that lady in, in Irvine County, no college, just a natural businesswoman, clearly intelligent. Um,
But what you're saying about the schools, it's apt. I mean, you see, this comes back to culture. I think Latinas have still got a family culture, and that's absolutely essential. It's gone from the African Americans. I mean, 72 percent, 80 percent of the children are born out of wedlock. They're in those places like in Baltimore. We've seen it. The mothers try to bring up their kids. They've got no hope. Schools are terrible. They, they don't get a chance. To, they can't get jobs. Um, the, the rate of unemployment of uh, African Americans under 30 is just enormous. Um, and you know they turn to crime or gang or, if you like, just a lot of welfare. Uh, and this is a problem we have to tackle. Um, and I don't know quite where we start. But I think Latinos have an advantage. They still, more than any other group, have a family culture. So hang on to that at all costs. I would just add one other thing to what Rupert said, because I'm, I'm a glass is half full guy, right? I, I like focusing on all that can be done as opposed to what hasn't been, okay? So, so let me give you a scenario in today's economy. I can take you to parts of LA, to Phoenix, to a lot of cities around the country where 15, 20 years ago, because I've lived in several states in the US, and I've been very active wherever I've been, and I can show you bad numbers, bad, you know, high dropout rates, high, you know, high gang membership, high, you know, all the negative stuff. What's happened in that last 15, 20 years is that people did get their high school degree. They did, they, maybe they were pounding nails as a carpenter or working for a construction company or whatever as an employee. But in today's context, some of those people have now become Lucero contracting, Garcia plumbing, whatever, and they've turned from being um, a mechanic, if you will, in a trade to being an owner of a business now employing, some cases, familia, and in other cases, other people, as we saw in some of the, the research data. And now when we're looking at 4.5% unemployment, and yes, there are some people that are not on the rolls, but the Wall Street Journal just did a, a story a few days ago that showed who those people might be, and they're not these kinds of people. They, they tend to be older, they tend to be people that have been displaced in an industry and they're not you know, looking to be re-educated at 53 or 55 or 60 or whatever it might be. My point is, is that I can show you, and the data shows this, the proliferation of, of businesses that have names like Garcia, Martinez, Aragon, whatever it might be, wherever it might be, because they've learned a trade, they may not have a master's degree, they may not have a PhD, but they're getting a PhD in real business, growing their businesses, et cetera, et cetera. That's the hope. That's the glass is half full opportunity. And as Rupert said, because of this family orientation, because of a community dedication, these things are still very possible and they're actually happening. And dropout rates are falling. More of their kids are now going on to college and doing other things. And I'll say one other thing. I was at a, I, I spoke at the Republican governor's um, group the week after the election. And, and they asked me to come and talk about how do we grow our economy. Now I have a phrase that I use, which I believe in, which is we have a new mainstream economy. And Rupert's, you know, heard this many times, we've talked about it, and I think we all agree that this is happening, right? People don't quite see it yet, but it's unfolding. Well, one of the, th the governors that was there was the governor of Arkansas. And he was talking about what they're doing for these kids that you described. You know, that they haven't traditionally been the kind that graduate or go on to college or whatever. And so he's implemented a program in the state of Arkansas where every kid has to take a class. It's a, it's a mandatory class on coding. Because today in a digital world, everything has software associated with it. And somebody's got to write the software. Sometimes somebody's got to fix the software. Sometimes somebody has to edit 
or review the software. So there's all kinds of jobs that don't require a degree per se or a PhD. And there's lots of those evolving in our digital economy that we have today. And so I was listening to this governor of Arkansas and it prompted other governors to talk about similar things that they're doing in North Dakota and, and other states. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, forget what we hear about with President-elect Trump, okay? Because I have certain opinions about is that the right focus or not. But put that aside. The governors in states where they see people every day, they interface with people every day, these governors now, we have a new generation of governors that are starting to make real differences in terms of dealing with that. And again, when we're at 4.5% unemployment, and you, you go around to almost every state now and you see help wanted signs, you know, and you, you go online and you see all these post job postings, there's a lot of opportunity now, and people should now seize that moment and remember that the glass is half full. Great. Hi, Mike. Uh, let's go. Uh, my name is Anna Bermudez. I am um, the founder and CEO of Tagit, um, and I was a graduate of SLELP One. So thank you both for your time. Uh, uh, Mr. Murdoch, you brought up a very good point, um, and you said the word risk uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, having been in the finance industry for almost 10 years, um, the majority of my job was to uh, not only quantify, but also analyze risk. Now, there's no data or study behind this. This is solely my personal experience. Um, but what I've encountered as an entrepreneur in tech, as a Latina tech entrepreneur, um, is that the risk on the investor side um, within my demographic isn't as big. So within my company, the majority of my investors, for the exception of one, only one investor um, is a Latina. All others are non-Latinos um, and they are men. That's just you know the way it's worked out for us. So in your opinion, um, what do you believe is the risk that the community is having because when I approach a non-Latino um, and they ask me, well, is your community investing in you? I say, yeah, one. <laughs> one of my investors decided to invest in us. How do you quantify that risk or what do you think is raising that level of risk um, for an entrepreneur like me? Mm. Do you, want to, sure. do, you, do you want to explain, while well, he's thinking about his answer, explain what Tagit is? Yes, uh, Tagit is a software platform that TV networks use to monetize ads and product placement. Um, through an app, you click on it and you're able to buy exactly what you see on TV as you see it. Ah, great. Well, you say, how do we assess the risk? In your opinion, um, what do you think investors in my community are seeing in Latino tech entrepreneurs? In tech, I don't, I think, you know, they're looking for the idea, they're looking for the person and the people. I mean, the best investors I know around here tend to come in maybe in the second stage of a company, but they first see this going and the chief executive, the founder is still chief executive, get to know them, get satisfied with their character, that they're really hardworking, that they're intelligent, then they invest. You look at people and their characters. I know a lot of people in the early days, uh, for a while, no one had touched me then. Uh, people I got to know, some backed me personally. Banks took risks for me, uh, risk with me. And, you know, it worked out. But it's, you have to, when you're deciding, when you're investing, you've got to look at the person who's got the idea, and you know, what sort of people are they? Sorry, more than just the idea. Well, well just a quick comment. Um, I think one of the things that we're gonna, again, pursue in research next year is that with most <laughs> Latino entrepreneurs, and I'm not talking about your case because I don't wanna personalize anything, but one of the things that people are learning, if you, if you did a comparative study 
to non-Latino entrepreneurs and those that are scaling and why they're growing faster is that there is a willingness to give up equity early. So that if I really need that core capital that's going to allow me to really grow fast, I may give up more equity now because 100% of nothing is nothing, right? But if I keep 70% or 60% or 80%, whatever the number is, of something, but I get all the capital I need, the math works out much better. And you know the continuous fundraising and all that kind of stuff. I've done a startup myself. So I've been through the stages of raising that first round and the second round and all that sort of thing. So I've, I've lived the big corporate life and I've also done startups and I've invested in, in some. I would say that one of the things here is the familiarity of, of equity and managing equity. Do you give it up? How soon do you give it up? There's some of that that becomes part of the consideration that every business has to, to think about. So in the case of, sure. let's say, Rupert, in his situation, or you look at now Snap is going to have a big IPO. And they're structuring, they're understanding that they might need some capital, and maybe they want to take some money off the table too. But they're structuring voting rights and control so that they can keep what they want in terms of control, but they're giving up you know, other form of equity so that they can get, attract the capital. So you know, there's some thinking here about what is your medium term, your long term. You know, do you wanna, how fast do you want to get there? So that then you think about these trade-offs. I mean, I've been through a lot of these personally as an investor and, and also sitting on a couple boards of, of some of these companies. And it's always the, it's the same question. So Phil is standing up. We have to move on. <laughs> okay. Rupert, Rupert does have a commitment. So help me thank Rupert again for oh, taking the time to come out here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, so up. Thanks, Thanks so much Thank for you. your time. I very much appreciate it. There's a couple of networks I want to talk to you guys. If you go with Roberto here, he'll help you. We need to catch him while we can with the two of you. Again, there's a, a few things I want to do before we move on. I'll try to do it very quickly. I want to thank also some of the uh, uh, other folks here from Stanford that, that uh, took the time to be part of this. So Professor Camarillo, thank you for being here. Professor Oyer, we had uh, Professor Van Horn here earlier. Um, also, we have uh, uh, trustees and former trustees of the university, so Miriam, Miriam Rivera. Um, and uh, also, uh, the next speaker who I'm going to introduce uh, is a, f a good friend of mine, also a classmate of mine, Victor Adias. Victor uh, is VP at Corn Ferry International, uh, he is Stanford University uh, Trustee Emeritus, uh, also one of the other uh, board members of LBAN. So Victor, if you join us, and as he's walking up, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank another board member in the back who's Frank Ramirez. Frank, if you want to wave it, folks, and let them know who you are here. Um, and <laughs> I appreciate the support, and of course, uh, Saul Trujillo is also one of the LBAN board members and has been extremely, extremely supportive of all of our efforts here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Victor. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, no hay que saber, no hay que llegar primero, pero hay que saber llegar. A very famous philosopher from Mexico, Vicente Fernandez, um, and uh, so the story really is, it, it's not necessary to be number one, but we have to know how to get there. And I think that's what this is about. This is about how we pull each other across that goal line and how we help each other. And just given the questions, it's going to take, there's a lot of interest here in convening lots of uh, different groups and making us uh, successful. Uh, thanks again to Rupert and to uh, uh, Dean Levin, 
for also for convening and hosting us here. Um, and I want to also want to thank um, uh, in absentia uh, President Mark Tessier Levine. Uh, one of the things that our former president John Hennessy said, this is very important. It's so important that there should be no other place that this kind of effort should take place other than Stanford. And, and you know, uh, Rupert Murdoch talked a lot about education. This educational institution pulls people in from the communities, and that's what it gives us strength. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me just introduce um, my, uh, my colleague here who is on the, currently on the, on the Board of Trustees at Stanford. Um, he's originally from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Anybody know where that is? Okay, it's a suburb of El Paso, Texas. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding you. But uh, uh, very close communities that work together. And, um, but Fred has had an incredible career. He uh, went to Stanford, uh, studied econ, and then went to law school uh, at Stanford and has had a very storied career as an attorney. Uh, he worked as, as, a, as an appointee by President Reagan. Uh, in the Department of Labor. He is one of the preeminent employee, employment lawyers in this country. And so it was important for Fred to come here and at least uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what, what this means to Stanford as his role as a trustee. So please welcome Fred Alvarez. Thank you, Las Cruces is really the bedroom community for El Paso, <laughs> if you could drive 40 miles. Victor, thank you so much. I won't take much more of your time. It's been a great morning. Uh, but I have to say that when you hear and see the results that we saw today, uh, it's hard not to get inspired by the possibilities. Um, it's hard not to see the upside for all of us, not just the Latino community, but for all of us, if we can leverage the entrepreneurship that's alive and well and a part of the Latino community. Just a quick thought, I have to think, and I thought about this morning, my grandfather in Mexico. He, he scraped together what little he had to open a little tiny grocery store. Um, it didn't even qualify to be a corner grocery store because it was so small, probably the size of this stage. Um, and as hard as he worked, um, as long as he spent at it, it wasn't ever going to get any bigger um, until, unless, unless and until he got someone to invest in it, which, which he never could. Um, I think we've heard about the same sort of spirit in our community, but we're running up against the obstacles about getting more investment in it. We've heard about the spirit that, that the Latino community has and that untapped upside potential. And I submit that that potential is accretive. Uh, it's not deductive. If we can invest in this community, they'll come up with things that we didn't even know we needed. They'll serve needs that currently go unmet. Uh, so like my grandfather, if we could just find a way to unlock what that contribution can be. So I say thanks to the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative for showing us what's possible. Thanks to the Graduate School of Business, uh, its faculty and its alumni for providing the platform for this great and important work. You know, it's hard to imagine a place that understands and supports and reimagines entrepreneurship better than the GSB. Um, you add to that the work that, that this conference, uh, it shows that there's a real commitment, a real interest in the diversity of our business community. So those two things are operating here. And so when you put those together, um, we start to see how empower empowerment of the Latino business community can be achieved, and it can be achieved right here. Um, in important ways, the Latino business community serves everybody. It, it serves everyone, all of its customers, it serves all of its employees, and so for everyone, empowerment, the empowerment strategies we're talking about here is really a win-win. So on behalf of the university, I want to thank you for help making this case to us. Uh, it's a compelling case, and thanks for making it here where it 
<coughs> deserves to be made. Uh, we're proud of your work, and we're excited to see what you come up with next. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Great. Thanks again, Fred. I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate the support of the university and of the GSB specifically. Uh, with that, what I'd, I'd like to do is, before we forget, is to thank the folks that helped put this together. So first of all, for the, both the, the uh, Circle staff under, under Wendy York Vest, as well as the CES staff under Deb Whitman, wherever Deb may have joined, uh, and the staff and their staff that is here to make this work. So thank you very much. It wouldn't have happened without your help and, and your support. Uh, along with that is also the LBAN staff that's also here uh, to make all of this happen. And again, I, I appreciate everyone's hard work. Uh, you, you might imagine the hours that go into this uh, and the hard work that, that helps make this possible. So uh, again, thanks for the folks that are doing the real work rather than folks like myself that have to remember how to put a tie on again. So uh, with that, one last thing I want to do is, is, just, is just close by reminding everyone that the data that we showed today, I think, is, is very instructive of what the opportunities are and what some of the challenges are. And, and that's great to do because you've got to have the data to know where you need to direct your efforts and then be able to measure the results of those efforts. But the other piece I'd also like to mention is the education portion of what we do here because that's where we get to see it live and in action. That's where we get to see the results. And that's where, quite frankly, my job is the best because I get the great and the warmth and the feedback from the attendees that come through this, and we can see the impact that we have. The impact is, is with part of the GSB that wants to change people, change organizations, and change the world. Well, I can guarantee you when you go through the program, you can see from the results is that we're changing people and we're changing those organizations, and I'm leaving it up to them to help change the world. So thanks for everyone for their help today and their attendance. Um, again, uh, what I'd also like to do is just welcome you. We've got some refreshments outside. We'd love to continue the conversation with you, so don't run off just yet. Uh, I'd ask you, could I ask real quick for the folks who have gone through the slow program to hold up their hands? So for those who haven't, take a look at some of these folks and, and ask them about it. I, I challenge you to do that. I want you to understand what, what they think about the program so it's not just me talking about it. So again, thank you very much, and, and uh, we'll see you next year.